Um, so let me just bring up my slides. Right, so can everybody see this? The slides? I hope I hope everyone can see that. Right, so um, hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth webinar from the Sheffield series, which aims to teach the Sheffield community to, you know, how, how and why you should grow your own food at home. And today we will hear about how to grow food organically which is very important. You will hear practical tips about sustainable soil care, how to promote biodiversity in your garden, and also how to avoid chemicals when you're growing food. Before we start, just a little bit of information about the project. Uh, I just wanna quickly introduce what Sheffield is about. Um, so Sheffield is a project born at the Grantham Center for Sustainable Futures at the University of Sheffield. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, some of you might be here for the first time. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, so the aim of the project is to raise awareness about how to grow your own food and why it is important to do so. Um, and we do that via a series of webinars such as this one. We also publish blog articles, vegan food recipes, and also various useful links and resources related to sustainable food. Um, as you can see, this is a screenshot from our website. Um, I can put a link to the chat as well, uh, if you're interested to visit the website. And um, this is a call for anyone who grows food at home. If you would like to write a blog about it or share some sustainable recipe with us, maybe, uh, then please uh, let us know. There is an email address on the screen that you can use um, if you want to send us any recipe or if you're interested in a blog. Um, and then uh, you can also sign up to our newsletter, which is also on the website. I'll put a link in the chat for that. And um, the newsletter is sent out monthly and you can hear about all the news we have, new webinars, new blog articles and things like that. Um, so yeah, that was the project. And without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Anton Rosenfeld from Garden Organic. If you don't know who Garden Organic are, uh, it's a charity dedicated to researching and promoting organic gardening, farming and food. They have spent over 60 years researching sustainable ways to grow through citizen science and working with communities and also with small scale growers in a practical context. And Anton, our speaker tonight, has been with Garden Organic for 17 years, really, really long time. His work has ranged from projects with commercial field scale growers to small scale community gardens and allotments. He has worked as a grower, runs many training courses and regularly writes for Grow Your Own and Kitchen Garden magazine. He has a passion for soils, composting and growing veg from a wide range of cultures and horizons. So I just wanted to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, and now the floor is yours, Anton, with me and- Oh, thank you, Jana. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for giving up part of your evening to listen to us. I hope you'll find it an exciting evening. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Okay, I hope you can all, all see that and that looks okay to you. Yes. So we're going to talk about practical um, organic growing today, um, beyond growing without chemicals. And um, just a few little household things. Um, if you can keep yourself muted during the presentation, that's, that's really helpful. So we don't have loads of sort of clinking coffee cups and dogs barking. Just remember, if you've got your camera on, you can be seen by everybody. Um, there's a chat function at the bottom. Um, if you want to ask any questions, um, if you want to put put your questions in the chat and we will try and answer them at the end. Um, so that would be, that's usually the way that seems to work pretty well. Um, we will also have a few interactive questions throughout just to keep you on your toes. It's not a test, um, but it's just just to get you, get you um, involved in, and interactive. Um, do have a go at them. It makes it more fun the more people have a go. No one can see who's answered what, so that no one will see that you've put a stupid answer. So just just have a go at the go at the questions. Okay, let's let's get started. So what we're going to cover, we're going to look at what exactly is organic growing, and then we're going to look at caring for our most precious asset, the soil. We're going to look at promoting and recognizing the biodiversity in our garden. 
and we're going to look at some of the most common challenges which people come across um, in their garden that, that they might think is quite a challenge to manage without chemicals. So we'll have a look at some ways of getting around those organically. I need to say just a little bit about um, Garden Organic. I know um, Jana's given a little introduction. I'll just say a few things about our our activities. Um, we're a medium-sized charity, about 20,000 members. Our main mission is to get as many people growing organically as possible. Um, we've been around since 1958 and um, yeah we do a wide range of activities. We're based just outside Coventry in a place called Wrighton and we have lots of different activities. Um, we do citizen science. We have people doing lots of trials in their back gardens and they report it back to us. And we've actually um, got 60 years worth of these citizen science experiments. And we, and we worked out that we've done over 500 of these over our time as a charity. We have a heritage seed library where we keep unusual and heirloom varieties. These are things that are not on the national list. So they're not legally allowed to be sold, but people can um, access them by joining our heritage seed library and get access to these seeds. We have a living classroom where people can come and learn growing techniques in an outside setting. We do work with schools, very important that people know where their food comes from. We do work in the community, helping people to grow organically and also a lot of work on home composting. We do campaigning and we give out advice to people. So that's quite a lot of things that we do for a small number, number of people and a sort of quite small charity. So this is just a little thing about our members experiments. They've been going for about 60 years. We do a, a range of things. We get people doing sort of wildlife surveys in their back gardens. We might send out seeds for people to grow unusual crops. Um, the thing on the right there is a type of Bangladeshi amaranth called data. Um, so we get people to grow unusual crops and report back on them. Or we try out organic techniques as well. We've got somebody growing buckwheat on the, on the left there as a way of um, mitigating cooch grass. So we, we try out things which perhaps people have sort of done in the scientific community and try and replicate them in people's back gardens. So what is organic growing? I'm going to ask you that. Which, which of these do you think most resembles organic growing to you? You'll see, see a poll come up and there's four different answers and you might think you might want to choose which one you think most closely resembles organic to you. What do you think? Perhaps not an easy one, but think which one is most important to you. Okay, if anyone else wants to have a go, I'm going to give you another five seconds. Okay, let's share those, share those results. So it seems to be sort of fairly evenly split by people saying growing without chemicals and growing that works with natural processes. In a way, I think it's all of those, those three really. It's sustainable growing, it's, it's working with natural processes and what I'm um, growing without chemicals. Perhaps the most common thing that people will say when you ask the layman in the street is they will say organic growing is growing without chemicals. But actually organic growing is a lot more than that. It's actually sort of working in a holistic system. It's thinking about growing, about the whole environment that your plants are growing in. So you're not just thinking of the plants themselves but you're thinking of the soil you're thinking of the environment that that goes around them and all the resources that have you been used to grow those crops so this is the official definition of organic growing um, from the international federation of organic movements the godfather of um, organic systems and 
that might look like quite a mouthful when you see that long definition, but when you break it down, it actually makes quite a lot of sense. So it's, it's a production system that relies on the health of soils, ecosystems and people. So soils are really at the heart of that. And it relies on ecological processes, biodiversity and, and cycles adapted to local conditions. So you're working with these processes and adapting to them rather than, rather than trying to fight them. Um, it also um, combines innovation and science and promotes fair relationships. And the reason really that, that, that the definition is, is a bit of a mouthful is because organic growing does encapsulate quite a lot of things. So it's quite difficult to get a snappy sentence which, which defines it. But I'm going to give you a sort of living example of organic growing, which I think is quite a, quite a good one. This, this man here called Vincent, he um, he's on the Uplands allotment in Birmingham. It's actually the biggest allotment in the country. It's got over 300 plots. And I was just asking him about how he grows his produce. And he's saying, well, I grow my cabbages over here this year, and my potatoes over, over, over here, my carrots over here, my beans over here. And then I grow them in a different place each year. Otherwise, they'll get sick if I always grow them in the same place. I don't put chemicals on my on my plots it's too expensive and I'm going to be eating that stuff I don't want to be putting that muck on on my things I use compost because I'm just making use of the waste stuff and it feeds the soil um, I've got my comfrey barrel over here to feed my tomatoes and then he said well you're from Garden Organic who are you anyway well, I'm doing all these things anyway and he didn't really particularly consider himself organic but he was a really good grower his produce looked fantastic and he was just really, he saw it as the most common sense and the best use of resources. And so I often think that organic growing is best thought of as a common sense, best use of resources that works with nature. If, you, if you're gonna try and squeeze it into one, one sentence. I think I should say a little bit about who's who in the organic world as well. Garden Organic um, is a charity which supports people and particularly smallholders and gardeners to grow organically. But we're not the organic police. We're not the people that check up on whether people are growing organically. Legally, if you're going to grow something and put the organic label on it, if you're going to sell it, um, then you need to be registered with a certifying body. And so that means you need to be um, registered with one of these organisations on, on the right. Um, so the Soil Association is the, probably the one you've seen most often. You often see that sort of little swirly picture on, on, a, on packets of things. Um, so they what happens is that you pay to register with one of these bodies they and then you have to keep a set of really strict records to show that you've grown your produce organically and then there are other bodies as well organic farmers and growers is quite a big one there's the organic food um, federation and then there's Demeter which is biodynamic growing that's taking organic growing to an even sort of higher level where you you're you are sort of working with phases of the moon as well. And um, it's very popular in European countries, actually, particularly Germany and the Netherlands. So there are numbers of different sort of organic certifying bodies, which will, will sort of give credibility and that sort of quality assurance that you are growing things organically. But for a small scale gardener, you don't really want to go through all that sort of paperwork and registering your garden. And so Garden Organic has set out a set of principles of organic gardening, which allow you to, it's, it's a book and it's online as well, but it allows you to sort of grow to a number of standards, but you police it yourself, basically. It's, um, it's based on sort of five pillars, building and maintaining soil health, um, encouraging biodiversity, using resources responsibly, avoiding using harmful chemicals and keeping a healthy growing area. And within that, you can look up various practices and then they will fall, you'll see that they fall under various categories. So there's the deep green at the top, the really best practice sort of principles, and there's good practice. And then there's things which are 
also acceptable. So it's things that you wouldn't want to do every day as a first port of call, but you might have to do them occasionally. So for example, using organic slug pellets might be something that you don't really like doing it, but occasionally you, you have to do it because otherwise you're going to lose everything. But it's not, you'd sort of look for other methods of slug control first. And then you've got things which are just never acceptable, perhaps, you know, things like spraying weed killer or using synthetic insecticides. Those would never be allowed under any circumstance. So what it does is it recognises that organic growing is not black and white, but you can um, sort of rate your practices um, according to this, these scales. And it gives you a sort of guidance of how you carry out your um, everyday growing. Um, so you can you can download that you can if you look up um, garden garden organic um, principles of organic gardening you can download that um, booklet on onto your laptop and, and and look at these things so let's start the first one this is perhaps the most the most important is building and maintaining soil health that's really at the heart of organic growing so basically, if you've got a healthy, healthy soil, then you're going to end up with healthy plants. So everything follows from the health of the soil. So what do we mean by a healthy soil? Well, it's all these properties. You're probably pretty familiar with them. You want it to drain well, but still retain enough moisture and nutrients. You want water to infiltrate the surface properly, not to sit on the top. We want the roots to develop well. We want it to support the plants. We want good levels of organic matter in there. And we, of course, we want um, good levels of biological life in there. So we think there are three steps to a healthy soil. Probably one of the most important is just the keeping your organic matter levels up, having good levels of organic matter in there. We also want to um, reduce the amount that we dig the soil. And thirdly, one that's not so um, sort of popular with gardeners in particular is using green manures where possible. And we will talk about all of those things as, as we go through. So organic matter, it's stuff that was once living and um, decaying plant material. And the importance of it is how it affects the structure of the soil. Um, it basically helps to maintain pores in there. It helps to maintain the um, soil particles as aggregates as well. So if you, if you think about it, it's like the soil is being maintained like breadcrumbs rather than like flour. If you've got breadcrumbs, if you think about it, that's a nice sort of structure to, to work with. But if you've got something that's like flour, um, what happens to it when it gets gets wet? It just sticks together like glue and forms a hard crust. But the organic matter helps to maintain those pores, which is so important for holding on to water and nutrients. Um, it, all, it organic matter in a way it behaves a bit like a sponge. It soaks up water, but it allows it to be released uh, as well at the same time. It also provides a food for the biological life in the soil and that biological life is absolutely vital for maintaining the structure and the well-being of the soil. Now you can actually see by looking at the soil the organic matter levels. The soil on the left you can see is in pretty good condition. It's got really you know sort of really nice dark colour to it whereas the soil on the right is really very pale. It's got very low levels of organic matter. So sources of organic matter, we say that garden compost is probably one of the most important because you're making it on your site. So we, I've given things a, a rating here. Um, we've got, I give them an eco rating because um, garden compost has got a five star eco rating because it's your um, taking what would be a waste product and reprocessing it on your site and turning it into something useful. It's also 
quite high and readily available nutrients, which are released quite quickly. So in that way, garden compost is quite a good thing to put on in, in the early spring on your soil, because otherwise those nutrients tend to get washed out over the, over the winter, especially with those warm and wet winters that we seem to be having. And it's got high levels of organic matter. So garden compost is one of the best things you can be putting on your soil. Probably the main barrier is being able to make enough of it for your garden. You're always running out of compost. So if you can't make quite enough for your own, then you could use green waste compost. This is what's been processed from your curbside collections. Again, high in organic matter. It's a bit lower in readily available nutrients because it often contains quite a lot of woody material, um, which is lower in nutrients. Your garden compost have often got a lot of um, sort of green material like sort of vegetable waste and peelings that's gone into it but this is got more woody material in so it's lower in nutrients and I find it's much more slow to release its nutrients and so for that reason I would tend to put it on in the autumn because then that gives it a bit of time to break down still got quite a good eco rating I've given it but I, it loses at one point just because and it's had to be transported over quite a distance, whereas your garden compost is made on, on site. And then there's leaf mould, which is an absolutely wonderful substance, quite underrated, I think. Um, it's basically very slow to make. It takes about a couple of years to make it, um, but it really does a lot to improve the organic matter levels and the um, this sort of soil life in, in your soils. It's pretty low in nutrients because what trees do is they suck all the nutrients out of those leaves before they chuck them on, on the ground. They re reclaim those nutrients. They know, the trees know what they're, what they're doing. Now, it's important to be aware that the soil is alive. It, um, it's, there's a statistic that there are one teaspoon of soil can actually hold more organisms than there are people on the planet. And I think that's a pretty amazing statistic when you sort of look at that teaspoon of soil and think what's what's in there. And all of these organisms are vital for the functioning of, of a soil. And um, they can break down the organic matter into substances that the plants can then use. Um, some of them, like the Rhizobia will fix nitrogen, take nitrogen from the air and fertilize the soil, and they will stem the root systems of plants, and they are vital in maintaining the structure of the soil. So here's an example of some of them. Um, there's mycorrhizae, these fungi, um, they can extend the root system 20 to 30 fold. So Basically, they're really helping the plants in taking up water and other nutrients, particularly phosphate as well. And so they form this what's known as a symbiotic relationship with, with the plants. The, the plants feed the fungi sugars and the, and the fungi feed the plants water and nutrients in exchange. And the, these really help with the drought tolerance of, of plants, particularly sort of larger, more established plants. They really extend the root system. And then, of course, there are worms in the soil. There's about sort of three different species, well, three different types of worms. You've got the ones which live on the top in the leaf litter. They're called the epigeic species. They're, they're the brown stripy ones, which you also find in your compost bin. And they just sort of munch on the leaf litter and break it down. And then you've got your shallow species, um, the, the earthworms. They're the sort of pale pink ones. And then deeper down, you've got the really long ones, which are called, which are called the anectic species. And they, uh, they take um, leaf litter from, from the top of the soil and, and bring it down to lower levels. So you've got, you've got worms which are breaking stuff down, you've got worms which are making burrows, and you've got worms which are mixing stuff up. And generally the, the healthier soils will tend to have much higher numbers of worms in them. The more worms you find in this soil, the more, the more it sort of indication it is that it is a healthy soil. So when you've got all that life in the soil, you really want to be doing less to stir it all up. The actual life in that soil can do a very good job of actually maintaining the structure of that soil. As long as you've got 
decent amount of organic matter in there. So we um, propose that it's much be better to be digging less in your, in, your, in your soil. So why do we want to avoid digging? Well, digging can damage the soil structure, break up all those particles and pores, which are all nicely established. When left to its own, the soil biology can do a much better job of maintaining the soil structure. Also, when you dig the soil, it stirs it up, it aerates it, and then that causes um, nutrients which are in an organic form to break down into um, more soluble forms, which can then get washed out of the soil. So you end up with nutrient losses. It also speeds up the breakdown of organic matter, which then releases carbon dioxide, so bad for climate change. And from a very practical point of view, it brings weed seeds up to the surface, which will, will um, obviously encourage them to germinate and you end up with a much more of a weed problem. So it's become very sort of popular nowadays. People have taken a while to catch on to it, but with, um, no, no dig, dig growing is becoming much more popular and a, a way of growing stuff. Um, just a very quick outline of the process, you end up um, clearing the plot of large sort of woody weeds and perennial weeds like docks, anything with a large tap root that could push up a mulch. And then you've got two options really. You can um, basically, basically what you end up doing is covering the soil with, with a mulch. Um, and if you've got a bit of time to, time to spare, you can put a thinner layer of compost on and put a mulch on the top and leave it for six months and that will smother and kill off the weeds. Um, if you're really impatient and you really want to get going straight away, then you can put a, put a layer of cardboard on and then pile a sort of about sort of 10 centimetres of thick layer of compost on the top and then you can plant into that straight away and the cardboard gr gradually breaks breaks down that takes up takes quite a lot more compost to do that so you might just want to do that in stages as you get access to the compost but either way works works fine and you'll find that the soil structure really improves and you'll find that you you have much less of a weed problem as well because you're not continually bringing weeds up to the surface. So another question here, we're going to talk a little bit about green manures, but you've often heard about green manures, but what exactly is a green manure? Which of these do you think, do you think it is? So I'm going to go on to the next, next question. Which of these do you think it is? A few more people want to have a go at answering that one. Remember, no one can see what you're putting, so it does, just have a go. All oh, right, let's let's see what you've said. So there's quite, quite a mix of what people thought a green manure is, really. And, and I, I think, really, that it's a bit of a confusing name. Putting manure in the name is, gives it a really confusing thing, because actually green manure is a plant that is grown to improve the soil. Um, so it's, the fact that it's got manure in the name makes you think, oh, it must be something to do with compost or dung or something like that. But, but actually, actually, it is actually a plant. Sometimes they're known as cover crops as well, which, which again, is perhaps it sounds a bit agricultural. And green manures have been around for a really long time. Even there's mention of them in sort of Roman um, sort of plant journals where they say, sow your crops where grew the bean, the slender vetch or the fragile stalks of the bitter lupin. Um, I don't think Julius Caesar actually said that. But um, they certainly have been been around for a long, long time. It's only since the introduction of sort of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that people have stopped sort of putting their land aside to 
um, grow green manures to improve their soil. So let's have a look at how a green manure works. What you do is you, um, you sow your green manure and usually you might do that in the spring or the early autumn, but you can do it any time really, as long as the soil's warm enough for the green manure to germinate. And then you just let it grow, do its work. It might fix a bit of nitrogen, it'll improve the soil structure while it's growing. And then when, it, when it's time, when you've finished with it, when you want to grow something else, you can chop it down and dig it in. Or if you're doing no dig, you can just chop it up finely and mix it with some compost on the surface. And then it will start to break down and release those nutrients or the nitrogen that it's fixed and add organic matter to the soil. So a lot of the leguminous green manures are fixing nitrogen for free. They're taking it from the air and adding that to the soil to improve it. But not many gardeners use them just because it's something else to think about or they might not be familiar with them. And Garden Organic has done a lot of work on green manures over the years. We've worked with lots of different types of green manures and tried them out under all sorts of circumstances. Um, some. Um, in gardening circumstances and on farms as well. So here's some of the things that green manures do. Um, they add organic matter to the soil, they might protect the soil surface, they hold on to nutrients over the winter, that's really really important. Leaving your soil bare over, over winter is bad news because you're letting all those vital nutrients get washed out. Whereas if you're growing a green manure, it will, it will hold on to those nutrients and, and then they can be released for the next thing that you're growing. They've got fine roots which improve the soil structure and the, any sort of leguminous green manures will fix nitrogen as well. So here's a um, couple of our favourites. Really like vetch. It's a really easy one to grow and you can sow it in um, early September and it, it's very competitive, grows rapidly, it fixes nitrogen because it's a, a legume, and then you can grow it over winter and then chop it down and, and leave it to break down before you put in your next crop in the summer. And you'll find that you've added nutrients to the soil and really improved it as well. So it's a really good thing to do. And then I'm really keen on buckwheat as well. Just if you've got a spare bit of soil that you're gonna be leaving bare, um, particularly in the summer, just chuck some buckwheat seed on there because it really grows very quickly and that will add a lot of organic matter to the, to the soil. So that's a whistle-stop tour of how to look after your soil organically. We're going to have a look at, go on to the second part and look at biodiversity in your garden. So an organic system relies on a big web of sort of biodiversity of various things eating each other. Um, unfortunately, a lot of gardening and farming has sort of evolved in trying to kill stuff. And obviously, if you knock out any of these stages, um, the first things to sort of come back with a vengeance will be your pests, because then there's suddenly nothing to sort of keep those things in balance. Um, so we try and work with these processes rather than trying to sort of go, go nuts and um, knock various things out and kill them. So that's, we're going to have a look at, look at sort of looking after your predators and the sort of biodiversity involved in that. And we're going to look at a few, few examples here. And so let, I'm going to ask you to judge whether you think the, these things are friends or foes, or perhaps both. So let's have a, have a look. Here is a special type of slug. Do you think it's a friend or a foe or either? Okay, another five seconds. Okay, so quite an e equal, even sort of mix there. And obviously, obviously there's 
plenty of slugs which do massacre your plants, but this one, this one here is actually actually the leopard slug. And you often find them in your compost bin. And these, these slugs are just interested in basically rotting down organic matter. They're not interested in your plants. So if you find, find one of these in your compost bin, just leave it alone. It's actually helping your compost process. It's really the little sort of small gray slugs, the gray field slugs are the ones that you've really um, got to look out for. They're the ones, despite being small, that do the most, most damage. So what about what about these these ones? We've got some cabbage aphids here. What do you reckon? Okay, let's have let's have a look. So pretty unanimous, apart from one person saying that it's um, that they're a foe. Well, yeah, generally for growing aphids are not such good news. They they sap suck out plants. They carry viruses as well. Perhaps the only benefit is that they do do feed the birds. Like blue tits will go go for them and help to help to clean them up. But generally aphids, yeah, there's lots of different types of aphids. Um, there are some which, which are specialized for certain families of plants. So these ones here are the cabbage aphids and they, they just um, specialize on brassicas. Um, but then there might be ones which are more generalist like the peach potato aphid is, is a light green one which will go for all sorts of different plants. Often they have alternate hosts over the winter as well, which is quite interesting. So you've got things like, the, the clues in the name, so you might have things like the lettuce current aphid. So it will go for your lettuces during the summer, and then they overwinter on blackcurrant or gooseberry bushes. So they, they've got these, quite a few of these aphids have alternate hosts over the winter, which, um, so you might want to look at what other plants you've got in your garden, which might be providing a host for your, for your aphids. So let's have a look at the next one. Right, let's have a, what do you reckon to this one? We're talking about the big thing in the middle. Okie dokie, let's, have, let's share the results. So most of you thought that was something unpleasant. Actually, that's, that's something that really is a friend of ours. It's, it, that's actually a hoverfly larvae. And the, the hoverfly larva, you can recognize it mainly because it travels snout end first. They're about a couple of millimeters long and they go around hoovering up aphids. They, they, not got very good manners. They tend to sort of shove loads of aphids in their mouth at once and suck the juices out. Um, but they really are very, very useful. So if you see little creepy crawly with a, a pointed end that it's traveling first, just leave it on there. It's doing a really, really good job on your plants. Okay, so there's the adult hoverfly. Obviously, some looks slightly like a wasp, but it's totally harmless. They're vegetarians. They they don't eat any sort of creatures. They just eat. They just like pollen and nectar. Whereas the larvae is this little pointed thing, which has got a voracious appetite for aphids. Okay, what about this thing here? What do you reckon to that?
Okay, let's share the results. So most of you thought that was doing something useful, perhaps a clue in the way that it's um, doing something nasty to that aphid. That's actually a parasitic wasp. Um, they're really inconspicuous. They're only like about a millimetre long, um, but they really are quite vicious. You can see there, it's basically laying its eggs inside an aphid. And what happens is that um, the eggs start to hatch, hatch out inside the aphid, and then the larva lives inside, then it pupates, and then the adult wasp bites its way out and explodes, sort of alien fashion. It's really pretty, pretty gory. And you'll probably not don't pay much attention to these to these little wasps, just because they're so tiny, but they are really, really useful in, in pest control. So when you look at a something like a cabbage leaf. This is a photograph that I that I took on some of my purple sprouting broccoli in my garden last last um, autumn. Now you might think that that's got a lot of aphids on there, but actually those are just the empty shells of aphids on there. Those are things when they're all swollen and white. Um, you, they they have basically been parasitized by this wasp, and I've often seen colonies of aphids completely wiped out by this parasitic wasp. And that's what they look like close up. You can see the one on the right, right at the edge of the frame, you can see it's just got a massive hole in it. So these wasps are really useful things. Okay, last, last one. Ground beetle. Okay, so yeah, most people thought they were a friend. Yeah, ground beetles are known as a generalist predator. They are really useful for eating all sorts of sorts of pests. They're really, really, really useful. So um, that's that's the sort of thing you want to sort of. If you see one of those in your in your garden, it's not going to do any sort of harm to any of your crops. It'll just just be hoovering up pests. Okay, so we've seen all these useful sort of natural predators in our garden. What can we do to attract them into our garden? Well, actually, there's lots of things you can you can sow. Um, these are some of the ones plants that we found were particularly good at attracting parasitic wasps, um, ladybirds, and particularly hoverflies as well. They they really like some of these plants, particularly. Anything in the carrot family, the umbelliferous species, they like fennel and coriander. Like when you grow coriander, you think it's, you get sort of fed up because you're trying to produce the leaves on it. And then it, very quickly it bolts and flowers and stops producing leaves. But just leave it there because those flowers will attract a mass of hoverflies. And then there's phacelia, which is really good, attracts a lot of bees as well, sweet allison and buckwheat as well. It, I mean, buckwheat, you, you can literally chuck some seed on the ground and within about a month it's flowering and produce and attracting a lot of predators. So here's, we, we um, did a little experiment with people do, growing these in their back gardens. And these are just the flowering periods. The, uh, the sweet allison was one of the first to flower. And then some of these other ones sort of went on to later in, in the season. And we also got people to count the number of hoverflies on their on their plants. And we found you don't need to pay loads of attention to the to all the sort of different graphs, but basically um, alisum and buckwheat are really attractive to um, to hoverflies early on in the season in June, which is quite an important time because often the aphids are sort of starting to multiply in large numbers before the predators have really got going but then phacelia and buckwheat were really these two here were really attractive later on but I, when we sort of tried rating these plants we said buckwheat is just really good because it's so easy to grow and it flowers for a long period for um attracting things so we're we are quite s sort of impressed with the performance of buckwheat both from a practical reason for being easy to grow and how 
attractive it was for a long period for attracting predators. Also, just don't be too tidy. Leave some bits of long grass around because that's where ladybirds like to rest over the winter. Again, not being too tidy, leave a few log piles around that will bring in those um, ground beetles or carabid beetles as they're sometimes known. And having a pond as well, really, really good for attracting the frogs in there, which will help to keep those slugs under control. So on to the last bit now, we're going to look at some of the common challenges that people meet in organic growing and how to manage those without using chemicals. So let's have a let's have a look. First of all, let's look at some of the harmful chemicals that you'd really want to avoid using. Now, metaldehyde slug pellets have now been banned for use for amateur gardeners. However, a lot of people might still have them kicking around in their sheds because they were only sort of banned just over a year ago. And so, but basically you really don't want to be using these um, because they not only um, they poison the slugs, but the, they will then, if the birds eat those slugs, they, they will then poison other sort of wildlife as well. It also, um, if the people often, when they, they see their courgette plants getting eaten by slugs, they will then just pour half a container of slug pellets on them just to wreak revenge. And that then the metaldehyde gets washed into the water supply and water companies spend a lot of money on removing metaldehyde from the water supply because it, you don't want to be drinking it. Luckily, it has been banned for amateur use now. The other thing we want to avoid using is glyphosate weed killer. You can see that sort of yellow tinge on the on the um, field there. Um, I was always told at Agricultural College that it was as safe to use as common table salt. Um, I haven't never took people up on that challenge, but it really it's been shown that it's not as benign as people first thought. It's been classed by the World Health, Health Organization as a probable carcinogen now. The other thing is neonicotinoids. These are things which are very, very toxic to bees. And most of those have been banned in home gardening products, but there is still one that's kicking around. It's called acetamiprid. And so if you see that on any sort of label, then please, please don't, uh, don't use, use the chemical. It's really going, going to have, these, these chemicals, they're what are known as systemic chemicals, they're taken up by the plant and they stick around for a long time. So any bees, with any, so if you spray that plant, it will then remain toxic to bees for quite a long time. Then there are things which we are able to use in organic growing, but we might that we'd only use them as a last resort. Now, a lot of sprays now that you see are, are soap or plant oil based. So they break down pretty quickly and their level of um, toxicity to other wildlife is pretty, pretty low. They work by stripping the wax off soft bodied insects. That's mainly aphids. They might damage predators, the hard bodied things to a limited extent, but not very much. So you'd only use these as a last resort. They wouldn't be your first port of call. And then um, you'll often see now ferric or iron phosphate slug pellets. And these are actually permitted to be used in organic systems, um, but only as a last resort. They're not as damaging as metaldehyde. Um, and if you use them in excess, they can be toxic to the earthworm population as well. So again, only as a really, really last resort would you resort to using iron phosphate slug pellets. And also you might see the um, compound called pyrethrum, which is extracted from chrysanthemums. And because it's a natural substance, it breaks down very quickly. But just because it's natural doesn't mean it's okay to be spraying it around 
um, li liberally because it's toxic to all insects. And so if you spray it near bees, then it will be toxic to them as well. So if you were to use this, you'd only want to spray it in the evening when bees aren't around. I'd say this is really, really low down on my list. I wouldn't want to be using it really at all, but I'd just include it for sort of completeness. So those are sort of all sort of toxic chemicals and then some um, organic alternatives, but really we don't want to be substituting sort of synthetic pesticides with organic alternatives. We want to be looking at preventative measures. So we're gonna look at some of these now. I suppose I should talk about slugs to start off with because they're everybody's sort of favourite topic. Unfortunately, there's no sort of one magic bullet against slugs. If there, if there was one, we'd all be using it. So it's, it's very sort of finding ways of chipping away at slugs. And so what, one of the things I, I do is grow my plants to a slightly larger size before I put them out. I hard, make sure I harden them off as well. So don't put sort of fleshy plants which have been inside straight and plant them out straight away. Make sure they've been exposed to an outside period for at least a few weeks so that the, the plant leaves are tougher, got more lignin and cellulose, which is less um, sort of attractive to slugs. And I find that makes a big difference to how so the amount of slug damage you get. You can also use sort of barriers um, such as putting plastic cloches and things over thing, over your plants. Um, there are nematodes which you can use. They're things which are a sort of natural organism which infects slugs. And one of the things I find works really well is just before you're sort of about to fall asleep in front of the telly, about 10 o'clock is slug hour. I find that that's when they start to wreak, wreak havoc because they think you're going to bed. So just if, if you sort of live near to where you're growing, just go out and especially if it's been raining and, and um, round up the slugs. Um, I don't like killing them. So I take them for a little walk down the street about a sort of quarter of a mile. I don't care what the neighbors think of me. They, they know that we're a pair of eccentrics, and do all sorts of strange things. So it, it's, it's fine, no self-respect, go down the street and um, take the slugs for a little, little sort of holiday. And that should be far enough that they don't come back. Then pigeons, people sort of always talk about all the sort of small pests, but actually a fat pigeon can really wreak havoc in your brassicas. You might sort of think that might be slug damage, but um, it's quite distinctive pigeon, pigeon damage because they always leave the midrib and they take great big chunks out of it, whereas a slug will sort of nibble away at the edge and leave a slime trail. The only thing that works against pigeons really is covering with a net or putting string across to stop them landing. Things like CDs or scarecrows, they, they really don't care about those at all. Perennial weeds, things like bindweed, very beautiful plant, but very pernicious. Um, there, there's not really a sort of one bullet solution against perennial weeds, but covering the ground will help it to sort of deplete the underground structures that are um, sort of storing up all that material for the plant to keep sort of coming back up again. And so if you cover for a period of a good few months, at least four months, and that will really, really weaken things like bindweed, then when you lift the cover off, you will find the odd one starts coming back up again. Just be really rigorous in pulling those up straight away. And then you'll find that after about a year, you've not got a problem with bindweed. You might just get the occasional shoot. And and gradually it sort of dwindled away. Cabbage aphids, most of a problem in autumn, and um, obviously you wanna try and do as much as possible to attract predators. Like I showed you that parasitic wasp can completely wipe them out. So we grow loads of flowers around our veg in our back garden, and that really seems, seems to help. Um, a jet of water is good at removing them. And then as a very last resort, you would use a soap spray. But you can actually see in that aether colony there, all those light brown ones there have all been parasitized and that will just gradually spread through the population. So, so that, 
you, you can see that the predators are doing a good job. Downy mildew and lettuce is more of a problem during the, during the autumn. Generally, it's people, a sort of common beginner's mistake is to plant stuff too close together and then it doesn't have enough air space around it and that encourages more of these diseases. Um, so just make sure that you allow adequate spacing. Also look, for, there are some varieties which are much more um, resilient to these diseases. So just look when you're choosing your varieties. Flea beetle, this is often a problem when you're um, growing stuff like salad rocket. Um, you see lots of little holes in, in it. There's no one magic cure against flea beetle. And I often think, well, I'm not really, um, I don't have to supply these rocket to a supermarket at a certain time. Flea beetle is just a pain in the backside early on in the summer, but it's much less of a problem later on. So I, I just end up growing, growing rocket later on in the season when it's less of a problem. And that's something that you have the freedom to do in your garden, just grow stuff at time when, times when it's less of a problem. Same with blight as well. Um, I tend to just grow earlier varieties of potatoes when um, blight is less of a problem, just because that's, that's easier that way, rather than trying to grow a sort of full scale main crop variety of potatoes. If you want to grow um, main crop potatoes then look for varieties which have a good resistance to, to, to blight. There's plenty which, which do. Um, and there's a website, um, if you look up, um, if, if you look up AHDB variety database, potato variety database, so it's AHDB potato variety database, they show you all the sort of ratings of varieties to blight. So that's a really helpful thing. It's often in seed catalogues as well. Then there's Allium leaf miner. Um, that's a problem in a lot of areas. You see a leaks um, collapse and turn all sort of squidgy. And that's because this fly has laid its eggs inside your leaks. And again, that's just really recognizing that it's a problem in your area and it's having to cover your crops with with um, mesh netting in autumn when you know that it's know that it's a problem. Carrot fly, common problem here, you can see there's all um, all sorts of little channels inside side your your carrots. Really the only cure against carrot fly is covering with mesh or growing in pots which are um, above a height of six feet or um, 60 centimeters because the, the carrot fly is a lazy flyer. There's, there is a sort of tradition that um, growing onions will um, repel a carrot fly. Unfortunately, you have to grow a lot of onions for that to work. We've tried it, we've looked at scientific papers. You have to grow at least four times as many onions um, than you do carrots to reduce your carrot fly by half. So it'll still be causing a problem. So basically the onions do work, but just not well enough to actually provide control. So there's a lot of things that get said by people, but they haven't actually necessarily looked at all the evidence. Then of course, you've got your cabbage white butterflies. Again, cover your crops from July onwards. Um, unfortunately, you do end up putting quite a bit of mesh netting over your crops when growing things organically. So recap of the challenges. First choice is preventative measures, having a healthy soil, timing of planting, biodiverse um, environment, and using physical barriers. The second choice might be cultural reactive measures like hand picking and removing affected material. And only then would you go to your third choice, which is using sort of organic pesticides. So sort of organic pest control is all about prevention and stopping the problem um, occurring in the first place. It's a proactive approach rather than reacting to pests after they've occurred. And you'll be pleased to know that um, just over the hour, we come to the end of the talk now. Um, there's plenty of information on Garden Organics website. Um, 
just Google Gardner or use any other search engine for look up Gardner Organic, look up growing advice. We've also got really useful growing activity cards under our school section. That's just, I know it says schools, but it's just really, really cl clearly laid out. It's good for adults as well, really, really helpful. So if you've got any questions, um, ask them in the chat or we can ask them in person as well, if you like doing that. Um, but I think Jana's going to go through some of the some of the questions. Hello. Yeah. So thank you so much, Anton, for your talk. It was really, really practical and just showing us so many different, you know, animals that can, uh, some of them I didn't even know they existed. So that was really useful. Also knowing that they're not always our enemies, because for me, it's like whenever I see a slug, I would usually think, oh, that's bad, but they're not all bad. So that's really useful to know. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for your talk. I think it was full of really useful advice. Uh, I had a question about birds, uh, okay. if I may have the yeah, first yeah. question. So a lot of people these days have bird feeders in their garden. Uh, it's like a really popular thing these days, I guess. Uh, so how do birds come into the mix? Because uh, can they like pick the slugs, I guess? Can they eat them and then help us with getting rid of them? <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of them do. I mean, particularly things like thrushes go for snails and slugs and blue tits really like they pick off so many caterpillars off a bush. I mean, if, you, if you've got a blue tit's nest near you, then just I mean, you never know that there's so many caterpillars on one bush. They're just going there backwards and forwards all, all, all the time. But then some birds, uh, they, they, they can be a bit annoying. Things, mostly things in the corvid family, like all the crows and stuff. If you've got young transplants, they mm -hmm. tend to, they tend to um, pull them out and put them in a little neat pile. Um, because they're oh, okay. looking for grubs underneath the plants that you've put put in. So they're not actually interested in damaging your plants, but they're just carefully removing them to find out what's underneath. So. Oh, right. OK, so that's not ideal. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I can have a, another question, what do you think about um, like these little it looks like a greenhouse, but it's made from plastic. It's like a plastic sheet in a shape of a greenhouse. Is that good um, to protect the, the vegetables or does it cause like my, my issue is because I have one of those and my issue okay. is that maybe like the air circulation is not very good in this under this cover. I try to uh, leave the little window open, but uh, I'm just thinking, you know, sometimes it just feels like it's really humid inside. And I guess that's bad for for like some diseases yeah. yeah um like you said i would try and open it when it's warmer during the day and that will mm. really help with it and for goodness sake just tie it down as hard as possible because the <laughs> wind will just blow them everywhere they don't yeah. tend to last very long is my only thing from a resources point of view that they seem to be quite flimsy it's just mm. my experience they but um they're good as good as a starting point you, you know yeah oh that's good to hear that i'm not completely wrong there. no 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 <laughs> okay cool uh, so let's go to the chat um so someone's saying andy is saying i planted bean plants on in a far farmyard manure last year at my allotment and they pretty much stopped growing and didn't produce any pods previous years they went straight into the soil and grew well could it be due to possible oh my god i can't even pronounce it <laughs> Without seeing them, I couldn't really tell you, but beans, particularly broad beans, are one of the most sensitive to amino pyrolids. Perhaps I should just say what amino pyrolids are, just in case people don't, don't know. Um, that it's basically, um, it's a herbicide which is put onto particularly um, grass paddocks um, to kill off um, sort of weeds, particularly things like docks and ragwort. Then the horse will eat the grass and the herbicide, the weed killer, then comes out the horse's rear end into the manure and then it can end up, um, even if it doesn't kill your plants, it can end up really, really making them sick. And beans are the most sensitive, particularly broad beans and field beans. And you basically see these really twisted, peculiar plants. But if it's at very low levels, it might just set them, set them back. So it could possibly possibly be. It could also be that basically the manure is a bit too rich and to be growing stuff directly in as well. It might, I think it it might it could be had too much of it, but 
difficult to tell without seeing them. The, 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 but the symptoms are pretty obvious of aminopyrrolid. They you get really quite twisted, distorted plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah is saying we have found a lot of plastic in our allotment soil from broken down plastic netting. So, do you have any recommendations for more environmentally friendly netting? Unfortunately, I don't at the moment. I think there's quite. I mean, if anyone knows of some, that would be good because I've had the same sort of problem really. I just mm. it seems hard to find stuff which isn't plastic and is durable. I mean, I think the best thing to do is to try and try and get stuff that's going to last rather I mean some stuff is really really flimsy and is obviously going to break down within a year or two so just try and get something a bit more robust but I think there'd be a good market for something that's made out out of something a bit more environmentally friendly I, I, I guess the problem is things like jute and cotton they tend to break down because that's what they do so it'll, it would have a sort of limited life so I don't know what the answer is to that unfortunately. Yeah it's not easy to find something you know that would be sturdy enough I guess so uh, yeah maybe someone will have that idea and bring it to the market. <laughs> yeah, I hope so yeah. Um, there's another question related to the green manure uh, is it any kind of veg and buckwheat or are there any specific varieties for the green manure? That, that's a good good question but generally they I mean, some things are sold as varieties, but vetch and buckwheat don't tend to be. You just get what you're given, really. So, I, th I mean, sometimes it's there are different types of vetch, but the other types are generally quite unusual. You, if you're growing green, if you're buying vetch as a green manure, it'll all generally just be sort of one type. And the same for buckwheat as well. I haven't seen different different varieties available. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then Emma is asking, um, she had some technical issues, so she might have missed it. You were talking about cooch grass. She's interested in knowing more about getting rid of it. Yeah, this, um, this is, there's been various work done, which shows that buckwheat has got chemicals in the leaves, which can suppress the growth of cooch grass. So you need to grow it until it's still um sort of green just before it flowers and then you uh, and then you chop it down and incorporate it into the soil and there's certainly people have seen that it really does um have some action on suppressing cooch grass it won't get rid of it completely but it will still really help this, this is known as allelopathy it's sort of chemical warfare between between plants but it definitely seems to be something in it Okay, um, thanks. So Sarah was also uh, asking about cooch grass and then also how to get rid of mare's tail organically. Um, that is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's any way of getting rid of mare's tail full stop. Just carry on pulling it out, unfortunately. I've seen it grow actually underneath ca canals, go be on one side and come go down and then come up the other, other side. So oh, it's, wow. it's fairly <laughs> resilient stuff. Um, you can make quite good use of it, makes quite good scrubbing brushes for your pots, but um, you probably don't need quite that amount of it. So, yeah, sorry, I can't really give a particularly great answer to that one. So you just need a lot of patience, basically. Um, Tom is asking, he has a problem making good quality compost in the Dalek style bin. Uh, he always has too much kitchen waste. Uh, he's troubles, he has trouble sourcing carbon to balance it out. Any tips for getting a crumbly good quality compost? Yeah, if you're putting too much green stuff in there, what I'd advise you to do is um, get is to take some of the paper or card out of your recycling, chop it up, and that's a good source of carbon. And so that you've got an equal mix of greens and browns in there. So we, we had the same problem at work. Everyone chucking, we had a compost bin outside our back back um, door and we everyone was just chucking all their fruit peelings and waste in there and it started fermenting and going horrible. So we mixed it with our shredded paper from our sort of office waste and then it started making really good compost. You also want to make sure there's um, some air spaces in there as well. So the screwed up paper will help with that and just stir it up a bit with your, I actually just stir it up with gloves and hands so it doesn't hurt the worms. Uh, and it seems to work really well. Oh, that's a really good advice. I had no idea you could put paper in there. That's great. Yeah, because yeah. often people end up putting too much green material in mm. there and that's when it just turns slimy. So, yeah. Is there anything else you can put in uh, besides paper? Um, I guess that's something that people often have a 
plenty of generally. I mean, particularly you've got packaging, you can put bits of cardboard in there right. and you could put dried out grass or anything that's dry, basically dry, you know, small twigs, but they take longer to break down. Um, bits of dried out sort of roots and stuff like that as well. So all, all sort okay. of that sounds that's dry material. Okay, um, and Jane is asking, she struggles to control red spider mite in her greenhouse. She's trying to keep it humid. What would be the best way to control the spider mites? Okay, um, well, obviously keeping it humid is probably one of the best things you can do, but if spider mites a real problem. There are biological controls against it. It's something, it's, it's a predatory mite that's called Phytocelius, and basically just just look up biological control red spider mite online and um, someone will try and sell you some. Um, you get it in a little sachet and you release it into your glass house and it's usually pretty effective. But you need to pay attention to the conditions being warm enough in your greenhouse. You can only do it at certain times of year, but it will all be on the website and how to how to use it. But you do need to pay attention to it because it's obviously a biological creature that only survives at certain certain temperatures so but yeah that's what commercial growers use and it works very very well that's great thank you um another question regarding a compost uh, are fungus growing in the compost a problem uh charlie has a brown mushroom that looks a bit like an elf cap that's come from the peat free organic compost um so is that a problem it sh shouldn't be a problem i'm not a sort of massive expert on mushrooms but um um you do get various fungi sort of sporulating in compost and it shouldn't be a be a be a problem obviously you've got an ideal environment for it so it does does happen quite often nothing okay. to worry about oh that's good to hear um sarah is just adding on to the paper in the compost bin is the ink on the paper not a problem that's a good question i didn't think yeah it is a good good question um generally inks are not a problem because the um the solvents are carried in our vegetable base. They tend to be um, based on soybean oil. Um, and the majority of inks, the sort of pigments in there are not a problem as well. And um, some of the brightly colored ones, there's a small chance there might be some metals in there, but they are in such tiny quantities. It's not generally considered something to worry about when you think about the amount of ink that's on a, on a bit, of, bit of paper and it's, uh, the only thing I would avoid is sort of glossy paper. Just um, I mean, again, it's kaolin clay that's used to get, uh, get that sort of glossy finish, but it, it means it's quite sort of impermeable to stuff breaking it down. The other thing with cardboard as well, some of it's been occasionally it's been plasticized, a plastic coating put on it, and you can uh, you can um, test it by doing what's called a rip test so just try ripping it and if there's a film still stuck on it then there's, there's a layer of plastic on there and you definitely don't want to put that into your compost no yeah i think with some paper or some types of paper it's really hard to tell if it if it's coated in plastic or not so if you're ever in doubt probably don't, don't yeah yeah you don't want to risk contaminating your compost like you say so in doubt don't put it in yeah, um, Sarah was just saying uh, she was thinking as an example of a bank statement. So I guess a bank statement should be fine. It's yeah, just normal be, paper. Yeah, best place yeah. for them. And she stopped using receipts because they have plastic in them. I wouldn't think that. That's interesting. Yeah, I think some there's some types of receipts. I'm just trying to remember the and they've got a toxic chemical in them, which is not really? so good to be putting on. On, on that. I've forgotten the name of the name of the chemical now, but um, yeah, I, I'd heard about that as well. It's, it's just the sorts of really small, shiny, shiny sort of receipts that you get. The paper ones should be OK. OK. Um, and tea bags. Yeah. Yeah. Tea bags is quite quite a troublesome one because everybody assume that tea bags are made out of paper and tea and put them in their compost but actually what happened over the last sort of few years is they start putting um start putting plastic fibers in because people squeeze their bags so hard that they split in the, their cups so those and those plastic fibers they just take forever to, well they 
basically you're contaminating your compost with loads of bits of plastic. So um, just don't do it. Uh, someone's just said PG tips are okay to put in there. There are gradually the manufacturers are um, taking the plastic out and, and making their bags recycled compostable again so just check on the label and check on the manufacturer's website so someone's like um, um clipper tea bags are okay pucker tea bags are all right co-op tea bags are all right a lot of these sort of ethical ones are uh, okay some of aldi's ones are okay as well but some of them aren't so just look look on their on their boxes as well or just use tea leaves if um this is quite an easy solution but otherwise unfortunately it's a bit of a faff but just rip the tea bags open and put the inside bits of tea in there but don't put the outsides in if because it really makes a mess in your compost if if the, you know you just end up with all these ghost tea bags of bits of sort of fibrous plastic in there yeah yeah that's a good advice um so are there any more questions anyone we're coming to an end. The... Good, good set of questions, though. Yeah, definitely. A lot of um, interesting stuff. Um, just going to give people some more time. But I guess um, if there are no more questions, like, is there... Right, Thomas saying thanks for your time. Very informative. Yeah, thank you so much, Anton. It was really, really useful. And for those of you who had some technical issues, we will be sending out a recording um, afterwards, which you can also, it's useful if you want to revisit the, the webinar and, you know, have some um, access to the information later. So we're going to be sending out the recording. Um, I don't know if you want to share the slides as well, Anton, or just the recording. Yeah, we can do that. Well, I'll do them as a pdf like as a handout okay. so you can yeah that sounds really good okay thank you so much for coming everyone and thank you anton once again this was amazing very practical very useful thank you for coming and uh hopefully see you soon at some point <laughs> okay thank you everybody just gonna